Richard, you're one of the founding fathers of the animal rights movement. You are the inventor of the term speciesism. Can you outline that concept to me? The word describes a prejudice against other suffering creatures merely because they are of a different species from ourselves. It's like racism and sexism and you could say classism also. It's using what I believe to be morally irrelevant differences, the number of legs we have, the, whether we're furry or not, um, to justify what are really unjustifiable moral distinctions. When I was thinking about it um, in 19, the late 1960s, um, everyone was getting concerned about racism and sexism that were both new words, and quite rightly. And there were huge demonstrations going on across Europe against racism and against sexism. And I felt that the other species should be included too, so it, it needed to be a word that drew, drew people's attention to the uh, concept of species. So I thought speciesism would be useful. Can you describe the situation in which the term speciesism came to your mind? You were sitting in a bath, weren't you? I was lying in a bath, I think, thinking um, we needed to have a new word to make people sit up and think. And that's why I thought of speciesism. And I then went and wrote a, a, a simple leaflet entitled Speciesism, and I circulated around Oxford, where I was working at the time. That's how it started. So this was a eureka moment, like Archimedes. Um, I didn't jump out of the bath. I s continued to lie there. <laughs> Do you feel that already before um, you and Peter Singer published your works, there were many people who felt that the human treatment of animals is wrong, but they are lack, were lacking rational arguments. Yes, it, it, that, 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 that's true. Um, there had been, there's a very long history of interest in the welfare of animals in Britain. It goes back at least to the 1600s. Every time a major war came along, it stopped the, the reform movement. But after Napoleonic wars had been dealt with, the threat from Napoleon had been dealt with, the politicians in London proceeded to introduce the first parliamentary legislation to protect animals anywhere in the world in 1822. So there's a long history, and there have been ups and downs since then, in the amount of interest shown in animal welfare. The problem <clears throat> in the 20th century was two world wars that uh, stopped people thinking about animals. And it, bega it began to be regarded as a sign of weakness and stupidity to be concerned about animals when there was so much human suffering. Uh, there was no intellectual respectability to the movement. And one of the things we achieved in Oxford was to give the movement some intellectual respectability. Up till then, people had tended to say, well, concern for animal welfare is for little old ladies. It's not a serious uh, intellectual subject. But because a little group of Oxford-based philosophers showed an interest in the subject and said it was rational and genuine, the movement began to be seen in altogether a different light as being something that was intellectually respectable. Can you describe how the Oxford group developed? As a, as a psychologist, I was an experimental psychologist at Cambridge. I saw animals being experimented upon there. I saw monkeys with electrodes in their heads. I, this shocked me and hurt me. I was surprised. I didn't know that psychologists were doing this. Anyway, what happened was that I um, was waiting to see a patient. I became a clinical psychologist in Oxford, and I was waiting to see a patient who hadn't arrived, who was late. So I read uh, a newspaper while I waited, 
and the newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, reported, had a small notice in it reporting some experiments at Cambridge, my old university, where psychologists had deafened some birds, some chaffinches, I think, in order to see the effect this would have on the development of their song. And this made me angry. And I had nothing else to do, so I wrote a letter to the newspaper saying there was a, too much cruelty to animals in research and pointing out that it was wrong to argue that experiments like that were justified because they were for medical purposes. They were not for medical purposes. And a few days later somebody said to me, oh I've seen your letter in the paper. So I was quite surprised. And the Daily Telegraph had not only published my letter, they'd made it the main letter in the newspaper with quite a big headline. And quite quickly other people, angry scientists, wrote in and had letters published in the Telegraph attacking me. So I had to reply to those attacks and it went on two or three times like that. And then suddenly I got a letter from a well-known novelist, Bridget Brophy. And she got in touch and um, said she'd seen these letters and could she come and meet me? So she came down and we had lunch together and she said, do you know there are some young philosophers at Oxford who are interested in the subjects? I said, no, I didn't. I thought I was all alone. It's nice to know there are some other people because I began to think I was the only one. There must be something wrong with me. And uh, anyway, she introduced me to Stanley and Rosalind Godlevich and John Harris and we got to know each other and it was a great relief to me because um, I was thinking that maybe I was completely mad to be so concerned um, but it was good to meet a few philosophers who could confirm that there really was a strong and rational case against the mistreatment of animals and we met on half a dozen occasions and talked about things generally do you believe that the philosophers have won the argument for animal rights? Well, you see, I'm a psychologist rather than a philosopher, but people call me a philosopher. But I, I wouldn't want to um, um, say that, but I take comfort from the fact that very distinguished philosophers like Peter Singer and Colin McGinn actually say it is a one argument. It is an argument that has been won. There are no longer anyone trying to seriously rebut the argument. Would you say that philosophers have accomplished their mission and now it is up to lawyers and politicians to take up animal rights? I would actually, yes, I think that's, that's exactly how I feel. I felt this quite early on in the early 1970s and I said to my new friends among the world of philosophy at Oxford, um, would you help me fight this battle in Parliament to get better protection for animals? And they felt, I think most of them felt a bit nervous about that. They didn't like politics. They didn't feel it was uh, them. So I did it rather on my own. I got it very involved in um, the political issue in, in Westminster, at the Parliament in London, and went down and, and made friends with, with members of Parliament. And then, of course, as soon as they began to do something for the animals, they discovered, in the same way that the media began to discover, this was an interest that actually concerned millions of people. Instead of being a bit of a joke issue, a bit of a fringe issue, it was something that actually people loved and were deeply concerned about and had been for years, and they wanted someone to do something about it. And within the space of a few years, animal welfare moved from being a, a neglected subject to being the subject on which members of parliament in London received more letters than any other subject. You developed a unique theory of animal rights which you call painism. Can you outline that theory to me? What is right and wrong is what causes pain and what doesn't cause pain, what stops or prevents pain. Um, people talk about liberty, but why is liberty bad? 
It's because the lack of liberty causes pain. Why is justice an important quality? Because uh, having justice is, stops pain, and the lack of, just, of justice causes pain. Uh, why is equality a good thing? Uh, for the same reason. Always you end up suffering mental pain, uh, causing suffering and mental pain. And so it seemed to me important to isolate the issue of pain. And by pain I mean all forms of suffering, all negative experiences. This, I then, of course, read the works of the utilitarians in, in Britain, people like Jeremy, Pen, Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. And I found a lot to sympathize with them. They also made suffering one of their main criteria. And they were also concerned about animals and, and argued way back in 1789, Bentham said, you must include the animals uh, in your moral deliberations. Um, but it seemed to me that one of the mistakes that Bentham was making was saying you have to add up all the pains and pleasures of the individuals affected by an action. And that to me seemed to be wrong because no single individual ever experienced those totals of pain and, and pleasure. If you have an in, one individual who is suffering agony, for example, as a result of what you've done, say a hundred units of pain, that is more important than having ten people each suffering fifty units, uh, giving a total of five hundred units. The utilitarians would say the group of people with 500 units is more important, is a, is a more bad action than the causing agony to one person. But I say it's the other way around because no single individual in the group situation has, this, has experienced that total of 500 units of pain. Yeah, you are saying it is a fiction. It's a fiction. There is nobody who yes. suffers 500 units of pain. That's it. That's the crucial thing where I differ from um, the utilitarians. Um, and one is concerned, if you want to compare one action with another, you have to look at the maximum sufferer in each case in order to measure how bad it is. Yeah, that is a co central concept of yours. It is. The maximum sufferer yes. within your theory of yes. pianism. Yes, that's right. I mean, I think the utilitarians and indeed all the lawyers of particularly in the English-speaking world, have got away with talking about um, uh, numbers. And they've got the, they're obsessed with numbers. Um, um, five people um, being, being caught up in an accident is much more serious than two people being caught up in an accident. Yeah. Well, it isn't, because perhaps the five only suffered very minor injuries, and the other two um, suffered l prolonged and fatal injuries that caused a great deal of pain. It's much more important to ask in each situation, not how many people or animals or individuals were involved, but who suffered the most. That's the way to measure it. Which mi mistakes do you think the animal rights movement has made, if any? Uh, oh, this mistake is that um, it's now fallen out of fashion as a political issue. And it's mainly because um, Young people, naturally, mostly don't understand how to get their views respected in politics. When I got involved in the 1970s, there were a number of people of um, 20, 30 years older than me who were interested, and they had the experience of using the political system. I set up, through the RSPCA, something called Eurogroup for Animal Welfare in order to lobby Brussels to get new laws. And we succeeded, mainly because I employed some older, more mature people who could understand how you talk to politicians, how you get them on your side. And that was the result of what happened. And we've now rather forgotten that again. And there isn't a lot of progress being made. We passed a lot of laws in 40 years, we passed 44 laws in the EU, and we had about a dozen new laws in Britain too. So that was also a success. 
but we've rather lost the knack of how to act politically at the moment. Which strategies you think should animal rights groups adopt and how should the animal rights movement develop in the future? Well, I hope they go back and give um, politics another go because basically there's a huge reservoir of feeling for animals, of sympathy for animals in the Western world and indeed in newly affluent countries like China is looking to legislate to protect animals. Um, so as soon as the human animal reaches a certain level of comfort, of affluence, as soon as they are not involved in wars, they naturally begin to sympathize with the other animals. And we need to capitalize on that. We need to get the politicians aware that, this, that people do care about this issue and their votes could depend upon it. Can you tell me more about your family background? Lord Nelson and <laughs> Lady Hamilton were ancestors <laughs> yes. of yours. Yes, yes, they happen to be. Uh, although L L Lady Hamilton herself was not a relation of mine, but her husband, Sir William Hamilton, was uh, a, a cousin of mine. And Nelson was my great, great, great uncle. Great, 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 great uncle, I think. Um, but I don't think that has any relevance to the animal issue, because they were not... They were sympathetic people, actually, but they were not particularly notably interested in animals. Maybe a certain fighter spirit is in you. Maybe, maybe, because I have some very fierce Scottish ancestors. Yes, and, and your urge to sink the armada of animal abusers. <laughs> That's a very good idea. What would you say were the greatest setbacks or disappointments in your life and also in your life as an animal advocate? Oh, goodness. Well, being sent to a British public school was one of my first major setbacks. I was very unhappy at my public school. The, the, the British tended to... The privately educated British for a hundred years have been sent to these things called public schools, where traditionally uh, we were treated very roughly. It was a Spartan slightly fascistic regime and I suffered intensely there. That was a, a major setback uh, but it may be it made me more sensitive to suffering than I might otherwise have turned out to be. If I'd had a happier childhood yeah. I might have been less sensitive. And in your professional life and as an animal rights activist? I, I'm, I think on the whole we've succeeded The, the major political setback and difficulty has been the decision to take on the fox hunting fraternity in Britain, where traditionally people who want to regard themselves as being a bit upper class um, very often become fox hunters. And therefore, if you threaten fox hunting as a sport, you are threatening thousands of uh, well educated, powerful, professional people, uh, many of them politicians or lawyers, and a lot of them with a lot of money. So the opposition to the animal movement in general has been very considerable and very powerful and very clever. What has given you the strength to always go on after those disappointments? Perhaps I lack the imagination to think of what else to do. <laughs> no, it is difficult. And I've, I've seen over the last 50 years lots of people come into the movement full of energy and then burn themselves out and disappear. And that's a great shame. One's got to sometimes, I think, step back and just calm off a little bit and try to say it doesn't matter whether we win, win or lose this issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the important thing is that we're there next year to fight another issue if it comes up. So we have to look after yourself a little bit. If archaeologists in a thousand years find those recordings, <laughs> like the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, <laughs> what do you want people in a thousand years, what do you want to tell them about the human Richard Ryder and the times in which he lived? Well, I don't think I want to tell them anything particularly about me, but, but the, the, 
um, it will be further evidence that there is this basic dichotomy within all human beings for being compassionate and uh, concerned about the welfare of others, other individuals, against which, of course, there are our, our negative feelings, our, our need to compete and to be superior to other individuals, and that these are always at war within us. Yeah, thank you very much for this interview, Richard, and I would wish you all the best for your struggle and an entire armada of animal rights activists and friends to fight this struggle together with you and fair winds thank you. in your sails. Thank you. I was extremely privileged <laughs> to do, do this interview with you. Thank you very much.